Thanks, Vic. My uh, charge today is just going to be to present some of the ongoing clinical trials in glaucoma uh, that we're doing here at Doheny UCLA. And uh, here's my uh, disclosures, which are related to the trials that we're doing. So we're going to be talking about four different areas. The first is anterior segment OCT. Uh, the second is posterior segment OCT and novel glaucoma metrics. Uh, and then electrophysiology and glaucoma, and finally ending up with uh, a surgical trial. So anterior segment OCT, as you're all aware, has excellent resolution of the anterior segment, very easy to use and quick compared to high-frequency ultrasound or UBM, and so it's really gained uh, widespread use. And uh, our group at Doheny was one of the first to kind of describe the angle, uh, the angle parameters that were first described with UBM and translate those over to, uh, to OCT. And this shows you some of those angle parameters, including angle opening distance uh, and the TISA, and, and, and these are all shown there. Now, with the resolution increase in SDOCT versus time domain OCT, uh, you can see the images change. And the, the areas that you're able to see, you have much better quality imaging of the angle, but you lose some of the peripheral uh, the iris insertion and the kind of the deep angle recess that you're able to see a little bit better in time domain OCT. With this change in technology, actually uh, Vic Chopra and the group, our group at the Doheny Image Reading Center has developed novel uh, ways to describe and identify angle structures. So instead of based on posterior uh, angle structures such as scleral spur, we're identifying Schwalbe's line, which you can see in almost every patient with this type of anterior segment OCT, you can see the ending of the corneal endothelium into Schwalbe's line, and we're describing the, the angle metrics based on relationship to Schwalbe's line rather than scleral spur. And so this was really uh, pioneered by the Dirk group and, and Vic Chopra in particular. So here you can see that in, in our study, 94% of patients, you could clearly identify Schwalbe's line and look at those angle metrics. And these are the angle metrics we're talking about. Uh, you can have now a Schwalbe's line-based TISA instead of a scleral spur-based TISA, and it really, I think, is a better measurement of the actual filtration zone rather than just assuming a certain measurement, you know, anterior to scleral spur. You're actually looking at where the TM starts, which is in Schwalbe's line, and measuring posteriorly to scleral spur. So here you can see the, the rotating image of a, of a 3D uh, assessment of the anterior chamber. This is a patient with iris bombay and, and posterior synechiae. And we, we looked at this uh, technology in evaluating patients with ocular trauma, trying to, to plan surgical techniques in these patients. And this is one such patient who you can clearly see has uh, P, uh, PAS over here, has iridodialysis in a certain areas. Um, and you're able to take, you know, cross sections through, through various slices of the eye, but you're also able to do the 360 3D image, which you see here. And what you can see and, and appreciate is here's the PAS. Here is the iris defect, but you can see an occult cycle dialysis cleft, which we couldn't really appreciate on regular imaging or on clinical exam. So it helped us plan surgically, you know, how to treat this patient uh, when we eventually got them to the operating room. So this is just a, a, a short list of, of the recent publications uh, through Dirk on anterior segment OCT glaucoma. And you can see this, this is just in the past uh, one to two years, so really a, a, a a wealth of information that, that uh, Vic and, and Voss and the group at Dirk have put together. What about posterior segment OCT? So this is a paper that's not published yet but is in, uh, in press, and uh, this is a paper that looked at lamina cribrosa density and glaucoma and the ability to differentiate uh, normals from glaucoma suspects from mild to moderate glaucoma. And it's looking at this area right here the lamina cribrosa, and you're comparing, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're using uh, the reference of vitreous being zero in terms of density and 100% of the RPE, and this falls somewhere in between, and you can grade that and compare it uh, in different patients. And what we found was not only are you able to differentiate normals from glaucomas, which, you know, is, is good, but we can also differentiate glaucoma suspects from mild to moderate glaucoma. Not severe glaucoma, but mild to moderate glaucoma. So this may be another parameter that we can use to identify and help us identify early glaucoma. 
OCTA and geography. Uh, Dr. Parrish said he's sick about hearing about OCTA, but here's one more thing. We actually sent this paper to AJO, so you'll be seeing it. Uh, the OCT and geography, I'm sure you meant you're only tired of hearing it in terms of retina, but this is glaucoma. So OCTA has been well described in the, in the retina literature, uh, but you can also look at the optic nerve head and peripapillary uh, areas uh, for OCTA. And what we found, this is kind of a busy slide, but we looked at patients with primary open angle glaucoma, and these were mild to moderate glaucoma. So you can see the, the mean deviation of visual field is about minus two decibels. So these are mild cases of glaucoma. And we compared those to glaucoma suspects compared to normal controls. And uh, this is just giving you the, you know, obviously the visual field is different, the cup to disc is different, and the RNFL thickness is different. But when you look at OCT and geography, no matter what parameter you look at, optic nerve head vessel density, peripapillary vessel density, papillary area vessel density, et cetera, every single parameter helps you differentiate between mild glaucoma, glaucoma suspect, and normals, and they're all very statistically significant. So you see this stepwise change in the, uh, in the vasculature in all of these different areas. So we feel that it may be a very powerful tool in the diagnosis of early glaucoma and even separating glaucoma suspects from controls. Okay, so quick word about electrophysiology and glaucoma. Uh, this is uh, kind of not your standard electrophysiology, but this is a new office-based system by Diopsis. And uh, there's some animation here, but just shows you that the, this stimulus pattern flickers back and forth, and the, the PERG or pattern ERG is measuring the response to the stimulus. How does it work? So it's an electrical recording, recording as you all know, and the PERG is thought to uh, tease out the ganglion cells and the macular function. Okay, so it's thought that the progressive loss of retinal ganglion cell function may actually precede structural loss as measurable by OCT measurements by up to several years in glaucoma suspects that are, that are now going to convert to glaucoma. And actually, this uh, is based on some work out of Bascom Palmer, uh, which showed that the PERG signal can anticipate an equivalent loss of OCT signal by up to eight years in glaucoma suspect converting to glaucoma patients. And so this is just kind of a uh, schematic showing that uh, the PERG can be used. Uh, it, it's a functional test, but it, unlike the visual field, which measures the loss of function due to cell death, this is thought to show what is the, the, the cell function, not due to death, but what, you know, how does the cell function in terms of stress. And it's thought that if you indeed change the stress on the cells by decreasing IOP, that you can reverse this uh, dysfunction and, and have a, a normalization of the, of the PERG, which you can see here. So what we're doing with our, with our trials is we're looking at uh, surgically patients that are undergoing either a MIGS procedure, so mild to moderate glaucoma patients, and also uh, patients that, are under, that have uh, more advanced glaucoma undergoing trabeculectomy and tube shunt, and looking at pressure reduction and the effect on the PERG, so whether we can show reversal in mild patients and even in advanced patients. The last uh, trial I want to talk about is now surgical. Uh, it's talking about the in-focus micro shunt. And uh, we won't belabor this, but these are some of the reasons why we are looking for alternatives to traditional filtering surgery, such as trabeculectomy and tube shunt. Um, and that kind of led to the MIGS era, and uh, George is still in the audience, I think. This is one of his inventions, the trabectome, which we at Doheny were one of the first centers to evaluate and publish on this device. Uh, but also looking at other ways to lower IOP, particularly the subconjunctival pathway, your, your, your typical trabeculectomy or tube shunt pathway, but looking at how that can be improved. And that's where the in-focus micro shunt comes in to play. It's a very small uh, micro shunt, hence the name. And uh, here you can see it's, it's made out of a material called SIBS which is supposed to be very non-reactive and, and not uh, uh, create a lot of fibrosis and scarring. And here, just uh, kind of schematically, you can see the surgery. The conjunctiva is opened. The tube is inserted. Flow is established. As you can see here, and the conjunctiva is closed. There is an application of mitomycin, just as you would uh, with trabeculectomy. So the data is pretty good, and here this is the, uh, the preliminary data from outside Un United States centers, and you see a reduction of IOP from the mid-20s down to the low-teens uh, with this procedure. 
uh, percentage of medications that are completely off glaucoma medications over time. It's uh, down to about 75 percent after six months. And it seems to do equally as well either with or without uh, concomitant cataract surgery. Adverse events are listed here. Similar to what you s may see with trabeculectomy, but we think may be lower. So how are we involved? We're involved with the, uh, the phase three clinical trial. Uh, there's been two phases. The first uh, phase, which was 75 patients, has already been completed. And now there's an, an expanded trial of 400 patients who are one of the clinical trial centers, both at Doheny and at Stein. And uh, basically, it's a randomized trial with trabeculectomy being the gold standard. Uh, the randomization is three to one, so 75% uh, chance of in-focus, 25% chance of trabeculectomy. Okay, thank you. Thank you.